Hey everybody, I'm Dave Chichimori. I'm the natural history curator here at the South Carolina State Museum. Welcome back to another Fossil Friday, and today we're going to talk about ammonites, which are these guys right here. It's just a small sample of the many different kinds of ammonites that you can find as fossils. So ammonites are an extinct group of mollusks. They're related to clams and snails. So we've got a scallop shell heel here as an example of a clam. They are bivalves, and typically there's two shells, a right and a left, and I just have the one here but they will go together at the back end, the hinge, and they'll be able to open and close their shells or their valves. And snails, we all know, most snails have shells, but not all of them do. So this is a helmet snail here, and the animal's body would be inside the shell, and the head end would stick out here. There'd be a little thing called a siphuncle that comes out of that little canal right there. And they move along the bottom of the ocean or on dry land, on the trees, those groups of animals, the clams and the snails, are a lot different than the ammonites. So ammonites are more closely related to a modern group of animals called nautilus, which is what we've got right here. So nautilus and ammonites are called cephalopods. That name means head foot. So if you look at the shell of a modern nautilus, it looks very much like these ammonites that we have here. And the body of the animal sits inside of this cavity here. It's called a body chamber. And the cephalopod, the head foot part, is from where the animal itself looks like it's mostly head that sticks out of the shell, and they've got a series of tentacles, the feet, on the front end. And they use those tentacles to pull food into their mouth, which you can't see, which is kind of in the center of their body there. And if we take a look at the nautilus shell and cross section, it looks quite a bit different than it does from the outside. And ammonites, if we took any one of these ammonite shells and we cut them in half, we'd see something very similar to this here. So what we're looking at is, again, this is the body chamber. So when the animal was alive, its body would sit inside of here. And then you see all these kind of spiraling empty rooms here. They're called chambers. And what's neat about uh, Nautilus, or even the ammonites, is that each of these rooms was connected by a little canal called a siphuncle. You could think of it as maybe a straw. And the animal can pump water into or out of these old chambers, these old rooms, to change its buoyancy. So whether it can go up and down the water column, so if it wants to go up towards the surface, it can pump water out of the old chambers and make itself lighter. Or if it wanted to sink down, it could pump water into the old chambers and make itself heavier. So that's how they'll move up and down. And ammonites had a siphuncle, but instead of, if you look at this Nautilus here, you can see right down the center is where that tube would have been. And on an ammonite, it actually ran down along what's called the ventral edge or the bottom side of the shell. So if you wanted to know whether you found a Nautilus or an ammonite as a fossil, you can try and find where that siphuncle is. And when you find it, if it's in the center, it's a nautiloid. If it's on the edge, it would be an ammonite, potentially. Um, ammonites have a long fossil record, or ammonoids, the group that includes ammonites, that goes back oh, about 400 million years or so to a period of time called the Devonian. And nautiloids, uh, relatives of the modern day nautilus, go back even further than that. And we typically know of them, I guess they were very common and very diverse during the age of dinosaurs, especially during the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods. The group goes extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, so at the end of the age of dinosaurs, when Tyrannosaurus rex goes extinct, and Triceratops, and Pterosaurs, so do these ammonites. And we're not quite sure why exactly, just this global collapse of ecosystems, and ammonites don't make it into the next time period called the Cenozoic. So ammonites come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. There are hundreds, if not a thousand or more different kinds of ammonites, going back to their full uh, ammonoids, 400 million year history. Many of them, or most of them, coil around themselves. So if we look at any one of these four back here, they may coil to where if you take a rope and roll it up on itself, that's called evolute, or involute actually, sorry, or evolute, dang it, forget which one it is now. But you roll them up, and that's what this one here kind of looks like. Then there are some that the chamber, as it grows, it overgrows the old ones, which is similar to what you're seeing here on this particular ammonite there. Uh, they have different kinds of ornamentation. So some of them have tubes or tubercles on them, little bumps or nodes that might be on the bottom side or all over the actual front face of them. There are ridges and grooves and all of these different types of shapes that we see are what we use to try and identify these different types. We've got some that are straight or they start off coiled and then they uncoil and start off straight. Those are called heteromorph ammonites. So something like this guy here, the scaphited, 
starts off coiled and then it uncoils slightly and is hooked. And you can actually see on this guy here, this is where the, uh, the head, the body would stick out down there. Usually when you find ammonites, they are casts. And so what happens is, is when the animal dies, sediment gets inside of those old chambers through the siphuncles, through that tube that connects all those different rooms. And once this fills in with sediment, it might turn to rock, it might lithify, and then the shell itself dissolves so that you have something like this guy here on the far side. And this is actually a South Carolina ammonite. But sometimes you can find them where the shell is still preserved, which is what we see here on this scaphite. And actually this Baculites here still has a lot of the original mother of pearl. And it's shiny. We don't know if it was shiny in life. It's hard to imagine, I think, these guys being out there nice and shiny and attracting other predators. I kind of think of it as you know, barracuda are attracted to shiny objects or a largemouth bass. So as a potential food source for lots of predatory marine reptiles, advertising yourself as being out there may not be the thing you want to do. We're not quite sure. But they did have a shell outside, just like a modern nautilus. When you look at the cast sometimes, you can see what's neat is these things here that are called sutures. And on this sphenodiscus, you can see they look like tree roots, and you may be able to sit a little bit better on this baculates here that is yellow, it's calcite, but the sutures stand out as these white, kind of dendritic, root-looking things. In contrast, on a nautilus, the suture is very plain, just kind of a straight line usually across the shell, but on an ammonite, it is very convoluted, and that's how you can tell an ammonite from a nautiloid. If we take a look at this guy here, this is a Cretaceous nautilus called Eutrophosaurus. Looks very much like a modern tiger nautilus, very similar, related to each other. And all of these bands that you see along here are those old chamber walls, and where they intersect with the outside of the shell is called the suture. So these aren't as common as ammonites at that particular time, which is unusual. So. I guess a little bit of history, the name Ammonite is attributed to a Roman natural historian. His name was Pliny, Pliny the Elder, and actually he passed away during the eruption of 79 AD of Mount Vesuvius. And he found these things, these, and he named them Ammonites because he re thought that they looked like the horns that were often shown on the Egyptian god Ammon. And if you look at some pictures of that, you can see these kind of coral ram's horns on them. And for any of you coin collectors out there, you Hellenistic period likers, if you look at maybe Alexander the Great, he was often depicted with ram's horns. So the Greeks picked that up from the Egyptians, and then the Romans picked it up from the Greeks. So that's where the name Ammonite comes from. It means Ammon stone. And some interesting kind of facts about these guys is we think going back to them maybe being snacks for predators, is there is evidence that ammonites were eaten by large marine reptiles like plesiosaurs and pliosaurs. So if you think of the Loch Ness Monster as what that might be, is this kind of big sort of maybe teardrop shaped body with a long neck and a small head and paddle shaped limbs to move through the water. Is animals like those, we found their stomach remains and there are crunched up shells in the stomach area that leads us to believe that they were being eaten, they as the ammonites were being eaten by these plesiosaurs and pliosaurs. And sometimes you can find shells of another ammonite called Placenticerus that's similar looking to the Sphenodiscus here that has these circular marks on them that seem to be in rows that people think that maybe those are bite marks from an animal called a Mosasaur. That if you think of an alligator with flippers, that's sort of what they look like, but they're not related to alligators. They're more related to, or more closely related to Komodo dragons and snakes. Anyway, I have found actually fossils of these Placenticeris that have limpets that are adhered to the shell. So the ammonite itself died, and then when the shell settled onto the sea floor, these little limpets, these snails, crawled up onto the shell, and there they sat. What happens is if that little limpet pops off, you can have a little mark left behind that looks like a bite mark. And I've seen them where there are three or four of these limpets on there in a row, if you broke all those off, it might look like bite marks. So maybe the jury's still out. There have been a few studies that have kind of measured the angles and whatnot to say that that's a Mosasaur bite mark. So maybe, maybe not. There's only so much we can say with fossils. Um, actually, some of the largest ammonites that there are out there, Paraputzosia, you can say that one five times fast. That one was about six feet in diameter. 
So there were, those are probably the biggest ones that I know of, at least from the Cretaceous. Um, then you've got some of the smallest ones or maybe just a few centimeters in diameter. You can tell males from females based on the shell shape. So there's a lot that ammonites can tell us. They're great index fossils. So ammonites were widely distributed. They lived for a relatively short period of time, as in the different species, going back to what I was saying about the shapes and the bumps and the ridges on them. And you can find them and determine that, oh, this ammonite lived for this period of time. When you find that one, then you know that that's the age that you're looking at. So they're good for correlation, trying to figure out is the rock you're looking at over in South Carolina the same age as the rock that you're looking at in South Dakota. So if you find the same kinds of ammonites, then more than likely it is the same age. So that's, I think, about it for today. Thanks for joining us on this Fossil Friday. If you want to know more, please leave a comment and ask us a question and follow us and we'll see you next time. Take care.